Yeah, she's just, oops. Okay, uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Abdul Gafar Obeito. I'm a senior software engineer, um, mostly working with fintechs. Okay, today I want to take us on. I want to take us on. Um, I want to like have a continuation on Postman and APIs. I believe our last session was also on this. Um, I think just randomly, if there's anyone that has a question from the basically from the last session or after your research, uh, you would like me to just put into my notes today. Sorry, Emanuela. Oh yeah, I can hear you. Hello. Okay, you are the co-host. I can see. Um, yes. What was my question actually? Mm. Okay, so yeah, anyone with any initial questions that they would have loved for someone to expand on before we actually start fully, please drop on the message. Before I start sharing my screen. Okay. Where is my phone? Where is my phone? I don't think there are any messages yeah. here. Sorry? Okay, okay, there's one message. Can I create my own REST API? Uh, yeah, of course you can create your own REST API. Uh, it's heavily dependent on which programming language you would want to use to do that. And what's your REST API, what sort of information, what sort of resources you want to give via your REST API. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to share my screen. Okay. Okay. Um, suppose we can see my screen, right? Yes, we can. Okay, so uh, API is basically and postman. APIs, okay, first off, interface. Interface is like a means to interact with the system. Uh, for instance, your full mobile phone has an interface, a user interface, which is graphical, which implies that once you touch this part or you touch that part, once you touch this button or you slide this, it results in an action. The phone does something in response to what you do and it gives you a response as well. Same way you have a console user interface uh, for most developers and system admins. You get to use, uh, there's this black screen that we see sometimes that people will be writing as if they are doing some very hefty hacking and things happen. That's a console and you put commands into the console and it gives you results. It could, you could, it could be as simple as you just iterating through a file and it giving you result and it's listing out all the files in that particular directory. Then uh, we have our application programming interface, which is the API, which is typically what um, a particular service would open up for so that other services can speak to them. Uh, usually people use a restaurant as a sample. Uh, in a restaurant, you have a customer, you have the cook, and you have the waiter. So the customer is your client in this case. The waiter is your API and the cook or the person actually doing the food, preparing the food is your server. So a customer comes in, he goes through the list. He has a, docu he has a list of, uh, he has the menu. The menu acts as your documentation. It could be maybe a postman collection at the person gives to you, or it might even just be an Excel or a, a PDF document, asks you to go through it and decide what do you want to do. The waiter is right there beside you. 
waiting for you to give him instructions, which is your API. Once you give the waiter some instructions, it takes it back to the server, your cook or your money or the food, um, the actual person that's going to dish the food and makes that request. If it's not available, it comes back to you and says this particular food is not available. If it's going to take a while before it will be prepared, he does the same thing. If it has been prepared, he brings it back to you and tells you, okay, this is it. Yeah. So um, there are various types of API protocols, of course. It's not just REST, but REST is the most common one. A representational state transfer. It's stateless. It uh, implies that at any single point in time, you can make a request for a particular resource, regardless of what other resources are being called at the same time, or regardless of uh, the state of, regardless of other things happening at that moment. I want to get this user's detail. Give me this user's detail. It goes there, fetches the user details and returns to you based on the request you've sent to him. It does not say it's 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 not tied to what you made, what the call you made before. I had requested for this before. So now give me this user. Now give me this. I've requested for a book before. Now give me this user. If you requesting for a book did not actually have an impact on the server, you coming back to request for a user would not have any effect at all. In it would not have any. Um, effect that is resulting from the first request at all. Uh, we have other types, of course. Uh, SOAP, which is a simple object access protocol. This one is tightly coupled. It's usually in, form, in the format of XML. We also have RPC, uh, Remote Procedural Call. Um, so we'll be looking at REST, of course. Uh, usually REST APIs, the requests are usually in JSON format or XML format. They are, they are still also GraphQL. The most common one is the JSON format, of course. I'll give samples of what it looks like. Then, typically, when you go to make a request via a HTTP, um, via, a HTTP via HTTP, you expect response from the server. These responses are usually come usually come back with certain status code, and these status codes are grouped accordingly. Um, we have those that start with one, those that start with two, three, four, and five. So when you are actually integrating to a to a to an to a server via its APIs that it has provided and you're using the HTTP protocol, you are expecting four different groups of response code, which will make you decide what to do next. Um, one, the ones that start with one is not usually common in our day-to-day -day integration, but it gives you information on what to do next, whether you should go ahead or whether this is whether this procedure is possible at all. That that start with the one that starts with two, typically tells you that it has as it has successfully processed your request. It might be that uh, it doesn't have anything to return to you. It might be that. Uh, it has something to return to. It might be you that is making a request, so it has accepted it, and you're just telling you, okay, I have accepted it. Three typically means uh, it has your request has to be redirected. It's either uh, maybe the server is no longer available on that same URL that's permanently been moved. We'll get into details of that. Then four means you have done a boo -boo. you've done something wrong, you as the client. While five means I, the server, have done something wrong. It might be that uh, I crashed while trying to process your request. So like uh, we mentioned, one X, so some typical ones is one zero zero, which means you can continue to the next instant. Uh, one zero two, which means you have to switch the protocol. Maybe uh, HTTP is not permitted on that particular server. And you have to switch to a different protocol, for instance. Oops. Okay, uh, 2XX, you typically you have 200, which is the most common one, which basically says, okay. It could be that you sent it a request and it sent the server a request and it's saying, okay, I have completed your request. Created, uh, this would be preferable when you are making, when you are asking the server to create a user or a customer or a book. You're asking to create an entity for you. Uh, accepted means you've 
ask it to do something on your behalf. Maybe for instance, you asked it to delete a user. Him coming back with accepted means he has processed it. He has accepted your request and he has processed it. Sometimes accepted might be that he has accepted it to process it later. For instance, I can make a transfer request, which will not be processed immediately. I initiate it, it returns and accepted. And then later on, I can call it back to get the status of my transaction. That's just a typical example. 204, no content. Maybe you request for a list of books or a list of users, and there is no user matching your matching your criteria. On that tree, um, like I mentioned, it means it's redirecting to there, there's basically there's a redirection. It might be that there are multiple, um, there are multiple, how do you put it now? Multiple URLs that it can be redirected to that you need to choose from. It might be that it has moved permanently from this particular uh, URL you are calling. It has changed. Maybe Google is no longer, so let's take Facebook for instance. Facebook is no longer Facebook, it's now Meta. 302, it's found your URL. However, it has moved temporarily. It might still come back. So you should come back for it, maybe. Another. Then we have the 4XX, right? 4XX, there are a variety of 4XX, but typical, the usual ones that we come across on a daily when we are working with uh, APIs. 400, which is bad requests. Maybe you're supposed to, you are trying to create a user, you didn't pass a username, that's a bad request, you need to pass a username. Unauthorized, uh, you, you did not send the proper authorization for us to now reply to respond to you. You're trying to fetch friends, but the authorization you sent is doesn't is not allowed to do such a thing. Uh, payment required. Maybe the API you're calling actually requires you to have processed the payment before making that call. So this is something it can return to you. It's still telling you that you have something wrong. Forbidding, like you are not permitted to, to call this particular API. 404, that's the most common one, not found. I can't find the resource or I can't find, I can't find the resource basically. Uh, 405, method not allowed. Uh, okay, we'd get into the different types of method, your get, your puts, and your post. But typically you are calling a particular endpoint, you are using a, a get, but the endpoint is expecting a put or a post. It would return such, a response code. Uh, the unsupported format, this has to do with the data you are sending. It's not in line with the format. It's, it's not the proper format as expected. Um, maybe it's a, the server accepts XML only, and then you are sending a JSON or the other way around. Of course, there are various other, um, there are various other for, xx response codes but well, these are your usual ones um 5xx typically means i the server have made a boo, boo i need to you you can call me back so if we go to 4xx for instance now if you're developing a mobile app that's consuming an api maybe an api from google let's say let's take for instance the map api if you make a request and you get a 400 it means you need to fix something on your side. So typically, the, you have to tell the user, let's assume the user is supposed to send his location, but he didn't enter into the text with his location. You made a call, you got back a 400. You know it's a bad request. You know the server doesn't have an issue. The problem is from the user. You can easily now decide, that, okay, I'm expecting the user to enter his location, but for this server to say 400, then it means the user did not enter it properly or he entered the wrong thing. Let me ask him, let me push him to enter it again. Same way for unauthorized. You can, if for unauthorized, you can redirect into the login page, for instance, if your app, for instance, let's assume you're building a FinTech app, a mobile, a mobile app for a bank. Um, a user has gotten to the transfer session. He has entered account number. You made a call to do a name inquiry. You get 401. The next thing you know to do, because you, you can see the status code is 401, next thing you know to do is to take him back to the login page. So these, these are part of the reasons why this status code are very important. Um, in the case of 500, 
or 501, 502. Let's take 500, for instance, internal server error. The server has a problem, it encounters the problem. The, you, you know then that the rest for the best response you can give to the user is there is a problem reaching to our downstream service or we are unable to complete your request now. Please try again later. In fact, that please try again later is one of the most important um, things you have to give to the user when you're dealing with 500. Because it means it will still be available later. It's just have a problem now. Same thing with maybe service unavailable. Uh, bad gateway, even bad gateway is related. Which I will get, okay, let me even iterate through bad gateway. Bad gateway, you have a, you have a web service that actually redirects to the various services and gets feedback, but it wasn't configured properly. He's redirecting to the wrong place. He can't find the exact resource that he's supposed to link you up with. He will tell you there's a bad gateway. Again, this is not the app problem. This is not the customer's problem. So it's best for you to tell the customer, we are unable to do this right now. Please try again, because you can see that it's a 500 error. Not implemented, that probably means they've never, they've not, they did not maybe, let's still take it for instance, a bank app. There is supposed to be a loan API, but the person at the back has not implemented it. So he returns 501. So he tell the user, this is not, this is coming soon, for instance. Okay. So we're going to Postman. Uh, let me go into my Postman generally. So Postman is like a ready-made tool that we can use to interact with APIs, to test out our APIs, to share our document, our API collections with people, to it's it's quite robust. It has a lot of features ranging from you interacting with the APIs, mocking out actual APIs, what, what you expect that you want to design, but uh, maybe the developer is not yet around. You can easily mock it with uh, mock responses with um, Postman and use it for your mobile app or your what um, whatever the front end is going to be. You can do it in the interim, pending when the actual thing will be built. Uh, so yeah. Okay, just I trade into I have a lot of collections here. Or well, let's first run through the types of requests, the request types. Uh, we have a get. We have get, we have posts, we have puts, and we have deletes. We have patch, we have options, we have a variety of them. But the usual ones you would come in contact with are get, posts, puts. Uh, some most servers or some servers, and um, you do use deletes. A get, you're simply saying, I want to get this resource. It could mean that you're getting it. You are you are asking for a specific resource. It could be that you are asking for a, you are going to search through. So you have to pass certain search criteria. So let's take this first API, for instance, uh, get all. The, okay, let's, if I, let's create a new, listen. so we want to create a new request. You can add a new request, new. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's use what we already have as an example. Okay, let's take it from here. You have a new project you're trying to work on. Let's assume, let's assume you're the backend developer. You want to build APIs like my, the person that asked like, what if he wants to build an API? You've built your API, it has various sections and you want to share it with the person that is going to be consuming it or with the people that would consume it and you decide you want to use Postman for this, what's the first part you do? You create a collection speaking to this particular project you want to work on. So go by new, a new collection. So collection is, it has a whole bunch of API requests that work together. They could be using the same environment variables. For instance, the domain, would be the same because they are all inside one single uh, project. 
the authorization across it would be the same. Like once the user logs in and he gets his authorization token, he can use it to assess the various requests within that single collection. So, so collection is like a, you're grouping all of them in one single project folder or something like that. So we do a new collection. Of course, you name your collection as you would want to name it. So inside the collection, let's take for instance, in, within your project, you have various APIs speaking to different things. You have APIs that are speaking to the customers. You have APIs that are speaking to maybe the books that the, that the customers can purchase or pick up or read or anything. Um, you, have an, you have a group of APIs that speak to that speak to payments, maybe payments for the books and things like that. So for a collection, we have what we call folders that you can create to use and group your APIs within subfolders -fold, sub inside a single collection. Of course, you can also just add them as it is. Maybe it's just one single request you have. So let's take this is my side example, for instance, now. Then of course, you can add a new request inside the folder or inside the a full collection, basically just do add requests, or in this case, add folder. Let's add a new request. You give your request a header, a, a title, sorry. Okay, this let's assume this is to get users. You select the type, the, the method in which the request is meant to use. Like I mentioned, there are a variety of methods. Uh, the typical ones that we use, get, post, put, patch. Patch is similar to put. You're the patch, you're just um, changing a single. Okay, so get, you're trying to get a request. You're trying to get a resource. Post, you're trying to add a new resource. Put, you're trying to update an already existing resource. It could be an update that would handle all the fields within that resource. Patch, you're trying to update a resource. Maybe you just want to update one particular part of that resource. Delete, you're trying to remove a resource from the database, for instance. Uh, various other ones, copy, you're trying to for it to duplicate a particular resource and so on. So you select the, re the corresponding resource. You enter the URL. Uh, typically, uh, would be using localhost because it's within our system. But it could the URL could be anything. It could range from it could be a Google URL. It could be any any anyone could actually provide URL for you. So the protocol, of course, you have HTTP or HTTPS if it's a secured HTTP. Then you have the domain. Your domain could have subdomains. So let's take, for instance, sample.example.com. This is a, an example of a base URL. It has a subdomain. It has a main domain and .com part of it. It could also be .io and the likes. Then, we have path which are being separated with a, a backslash, or sorry, forward slash. This would now, this, this slashes act as your directory. For instance, there is a particular um, collection of API requests. Some, one, some part, some group of them go to fetch or interact with the customer end. Another group interacts with the book end. Another group interacts with the transaction end. The person designing the APIs would have separated these into some sort of folder-like structure. And this structure would, is, best, is, is best interpreted using these slashes. Let's take, for instance, now we now have customers as one of the API 
So you have a path now that says you are going to customer. You can have it another, you can have another, let's do another request. Let's duplicate this one. So this could be similar, but instead of customer, you have users. So this has helped to redirect to a different path entirely. So you have path, then you have request parameters. Request parameters are additional infos you want to use as your criteria in getting the resource you want. Postman allows you to enter your additional query parameters use, coming to this params section, or you could actually enter them directly. So let's enter them via this params section. Let's take, for instance, we're trying to search for users and we have a user, we, are, we want to pass the username as a request parameter or as a query parameter. We expect that the query parameter has a key, which is the name, let's assume it's username, and then it has a value. What does, what, what should I use? What value do you want me to check? Do you want me to use as this username you are asking for? So let's assume the username is paid. So you have a so you can add multiple query parameters, of course, that will be used. This all depends on the structure of the API itself. Now, this is a get request. The query parameters are actually appended to the URL itself. So when we're going through the URL, we talked about the protocol, the base URL, which um, includes the subdomain and domain where necessary. This could be www, it's still a subdomain. The path, which in this case, we are talking about users, for instance, or customers and the likes. The query parameter aspect of it, which is being separate. So you be separate it with question mark and then every other thing you put has to be a key equal and a value. Postman allows you to enter it via this way, but you could also enter it directly in this format. If there are more query parameters to add, you separate them with the ampersand. So ampersand, and then you add another maybe password. Of course, this is not typically a nice way to make a login request. So the password is pass one, two, three, for instance. So, you, this is additional query parameters and you separate them with the ampersand. So the person that the, the developer of the API has told you, this is how I want my request to be. So you have to format it this way. Then we have authorization. Authorization speaks to the format in which you have, want to author, authorize yourself before you make that request. Uh, typically we have, we have a variety of authorization methods. Um, of course, there is the no auth where there's no authorization at all. There is an API key where you just, the user basically just gives you a particular header API key and asks you to insert that on your request. Bearer token. Bearer token is where a use, the API, the server actually generates a particular token for you that you can use consequently to make requests. These tokens are usually, um, the details, details about the user about the user are usually embedded inside this token. We have uh, JWT in form of um, encoding this token. They could have the username, authorities. Authority speaks to what he is allowed to do. Um, maybe the device ID, Various things, whatever information they want to embed inside this token can be embedded inside the token. So when you make a request, when you want to make a request, you first log in, a token is being given to you. This token has all the, de all the details that they need embedded inside of it. And then when you make consequent requests, where you want to now go and maybe get a list of books, he can easily check that, okay, this token is allowed to see the list of books, or it's not allowed to see the list of books and give you the corresponding response accordingly. A basic auth, this uses uh, base64 to encrypt username and password before sending it to the, before sending it to the API. 
So typically, if the API provider says that you have to use basic auth, it would have provided you a username and a password. Okay, then these authorizations and various other things are being passed as headers. So headers are like metadata, additional data that says that are like wrapper that are like a wrapper data to help them determine the kind of information or the kind of request you're making and also additional things like uh, would you even be allowed to do these requests those kind of info are being put in this metadata which is called headers this could range from your authorization the format of your requests for instance uh, we have content yes let's do this post so for instance we have a header called content type content type says uh, json application json so with content type the api knows that you're sending a json to him he could you could also tell the api what kind of response he should send to you which is where we would say accept accept could also be application slash json so if the api is the type that can actually send multiple or variety of um, formats like XML, JSON, as we spoke about before, you could indicate it from your accept, from your accept header. So typically, you are telling, you are giving certain instructions, you are giving certain instructions on what he should use to process your request, your actual request in these headers. Like we mentioned, for instance, you are sending him an authorization key. You are sending him the content type. What's the, the what's the type of content you are sending to him? You are sending him the um, asset type, what content do you expect from him and various other things. Content length is also part, which um, Postman actually calculates it on request, but content length deals with, you are send, as you're sending a request, you're telling him the size of the request. The middleman, if there's a middleman in between, he can easily read your content length and be like, this is too heavy for me, I can't process it. Maybe it's up to 12 MB. Maybe it's a file. Reading the content uh, length, he can easily reject it at that stage and and or the server itself can reject it that this is actually too high for me just by reading the content length. Okay, then we have your actual body. So in a GET request, well, you are you can pass a body in a GET request, but it's not usually done. GET request, you are trying to get something. You're not trying to make. You're not trying to push something to the person. You're trying to get something, but you can still have a body, of course for a get request it might be that you have a filter and the filter is not using query params and it's rather using body so in the body we have form data which is basically a key value format that servers can also process we have a ww form url encoded this is similar to form data however it's encoded in is is encoded so that certain par certain parameters inside are not converted to uh, HTTP codes that the server will no longer be able to translate. So it's encoded. Uh, we have the raw type. The raw type have variety. Have variety. Could be a text. Could be JSON. It could be HTML. It could be XML. Yeah, we have GraphQL as well, and we have binary. Um, binary is, has to do with files. Okay, so we have pre-request scripts. Pre-request scripts, typically you are giving instructions to postman on certain things he needs to do before it processes your requests. Uh, a typical example could be, um, a typical example could be, let's assume I have a, okay, can I read? Let's assume I have a, a request that's a part, okay. Let's take, for instance, a transaction API is provided to me. This transaction, I'm expected to send the account number, the amount, and a unique ID. And I decide that this unique ID should be incremental. So every single time I call the, the API from Postman, I don't want to go to the 
I do not want to go into the request and I'm going to change it from one to two, from two to three, from three to four. That instruction can be laid here for Postman to always increment it before sending a request. Tests have to do with what happens when it comes back. When once it gets a response back, what should it do? This could range from, okay, I've gotten a response back. If it was successful, save my save my token, for instance. Let's assume you're doing a login, save my token. Of course, uh, we have other things like settings and the likes. So we'd try out some requests before we go into actual, before we go into other aspects of Postman. So get all, this is a random API I have running. Okay. So this is not existing. Okay. So like we mentioned, we have a HTTP local host, which is our domain. In this case, we have a port that it's running on. HTTP's default port is 80. So things like google.com and, and all, all of that .coms you know are running on port 80. So once it's running on port 80, you do not have to specify the port. It would, um, it would automatically listen on that port 80. HTTPS, which is the secured version of HTTP, basically encrypts your request before sending it to the server. It runs by default on port 443. So whatever you request you put, you do on HTTPS with whatever, um, whatever domain you have on top of it, if you do not put a port, it would automatically be sent on port 443. So the server expects that he's listening on port 443 since it's, he knows he's on a secured channel. So, but in other cases, you have to specify the port. So in this case, we are running out this service on port 8080. So we specify the port uh, API. We have our path, uh, basically API v1 customers. If I want to do a version two, I can just do another redirection, another file redirection and put v2 on it. Okay. So this particular API, for instance, just calls to get all the customers. I've made it to have additional query parameters such as pagination. Okay, so this particular API allows me to pass the page and the size. So the page I can be on page one and size ten. Okay, so it and let me explain what this pagination is. This is a concept in uh, managing data and of course in, in, in implementing APIs. Let's take Facebook for instance. There are over 4 million users on Facebook. For, uh, there are over 3, 3 billion users on Facebook, right? Facebook decides to give me an API to be able to fetch users. And then I call the API, I say, get all users. You can imagine how much data I expect to be coming back. It, both me and Facebook would not like it. If I'm displaying it on a mobile phone, a mobile app, my users would not like it, of course. I can't, there's no way I would display for a 3 billion or 4 billion users on a single app and they will be scrolling to the end. So this is where the concept of pagination comes into play. Pagination, you're telling the resource, the server, that I need this list. However, give it to me page by page. Give it to me part by part. Give it to me, partition it before giving it to me. So typically the design would be you have a page and you have a size of the page. The page would, for instance, depending on the implementation of the, um, of the server, of course, the implementation of the service, of course, of the API, the page would be, okay, give me the first 10, which is page one. Size is what speaks to just the first 10, give me just 10. When I, after I've seen the 10, if I want to get the next one, I can say, give me the second 10, a page becomes two, size becomes, still remains as 10. If I want to go 15, 
page can go to three and size can go to 15, for instance, and keeps iterating that way. Um, okay, let's try and mimic this here. Okay. Okay, uh, there's another user has been added. Okay. So now we try the page. It's on page one. Okay, so it actually starts from page zero for this case. Okay, so um, for those of you coming in newly into programming, typically array starts from zero. But of course, one can actually implement its pagination to start from one. So these are all things that need to have been told to you via documentation that the pagination starts from zero, the pagination starts from one, and the likes. So I'm fetching for page zero, and I, the size is 10 items. Currently, there are, total pages is one. There are four items here. So well, that's still within the 10 of size. Let's reduce this to two. So now only two items comes back, despite the fact that there are four items in there. So I can now go to the next page of these two. Okay, the first guy there is no, no. Second guy there is name one, son name. Let's go to the next page. The third guy there is Faith Hassan and then Chima Debayo. So with this, you're able to reduce the load on the back end and also, of course, help in being able to, if you are displaying the data, if you're using the data for whatever you're using it for, you're able to manage it properly by breaking down the task. For the back end person, he gets to only fetch a few items from the database. He's not going to sit down and wait for the database to pull the whole 3 billion or 4 billion users in Facebook at once and shut, run down their server just because he wants to respond to you. And maybe other people are also making that request at the same time. So this is a get. This, um, we've been able to show request parameters, how we can make use of request parameters. In this case, we're using it for page and size. Okay. And also we'll be able to discuss pagination, a key concept in designing your API, especially when your data is heavy. Um, let's go to the second one. So, okay, this also still make use of request parameter and pagination as well. Uh, this is just a search, uh, it's a, 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 we're making use of page, we're making use of query parameters to implement a search. So the user is able to specify the search and what he wants to search for. For instance, I want to search for fit. Let's even just put it as part. So I put my request parameter key, which is called search, which the documentation would have in, um, explicitly stated to me. And I put the value. I do a send, it returns only the faith Hassan. Okay, another concept I want us to look at. Okay, let's look at post first. So in the case of posts, of course, you have your URL still in the same way. You have discussed about a request parameter. You could actually have certain request parameters here, depending on what the API asks you to do. Uh, authorization, we'll talk about the headers, body. So now our request format is JSON, right? Um, a typical, this is a JSON object. Of course, it has a key and a value. And the API, I said, it needs first name, last name, and age, which is an integer for me to make this request successfully. So I do a send. Well, I've created another Chima the buyer, but no problem. So yeah. Then let's look at updates, which is put. So in the case of puts, I'm passing 
a particular user. So I, the, a particular reason I want us to look at this is we've talked about HTTP protocol, the domain, the port, the path. We've talked about request um, query parameters. Another nice concept in API design is path variable. So path variable is like request parameter. However, it's appended to the path itself. It's not separated with a question mark. So let's use a single get. Do I have a single get here? Duplicate. Okay. This should be a get one. Okay. So again, I have my HTTP, I have my ports, I have path. Now, the API has allowed me to be able to pass a path that is a variable that can change, that can, it's dependent on what particular, um, it's, it, it's, it's a form of giving you a chance to add certain values to your requests. All my users have, as you can see here, all my users have an ID. I want to get a specific one. The API has said, okay, rather than use a request, a query parameter, let's use a path variable in this sense. So in the path variable, after customers pass me the path as the next, um, like a next the next part of the folder or the next directory, pass it as a path variable. So let's say it's two. This particular part can change depending on what I'm looking for because it's a variable. So I send it. Um, okay, I need to check why this guy is not returning. Okay. But anyway, the main thing we want to look at here is the fact that it can vary. So that same concept you are using in the put. I want to update a particular user. I want you to give me a you, you should first send the details you want to update and then tell me which particular user using the id that you want to change so for instance i want to change uh number two i doubt some of jackson is 48 though Okay, so the number two person has now been changed to this name and this age and so on and so forth. But I was able to specify which person using a path variable. Um, so this is for put, of course. Then you have a delete. Delete, you're saying uh, remove or remove from record, whichever way you want to put it. And again, a path variable could be a typical, it could have a very nice usage in delete because you have to specify the person you want to delete. It's a good concept to use in case of so in case of uh, fetching one single person using an ID, which is a variable, or maybe updating still again using a variable and deleting using a variable. Okay, so that's typically how we assess APIs using Postman. Now let's assume I'm the developer. I've done the APIs and I've tested it with Postman. Now I want to share it with certain people. Postman allows you to share a collection out. So you can do here and share. So you can share with people, enter their emails and it will be sent to them. You can send it as a link where you get a link. The other person actually just has to, you share this, copy this link and send to anybody. He opens his own, post, his own postman. Let's copy this. Opens his own postman. Can do imports. I'm importing it from a link, for instance, in this case. I paste the link and I do continue. And it imports, it finds that exact, exact postman collection for me. So you can use this to share your collections with other users so that they can also try out your, or they can see your, basically it's like a documentation you're giving to them to be able to implement, test and implement, of course. Um, another concept in, in Postman I want us to look at is environments. Uh, typically environment, environment is like a 
So environments, we store variables in this environment that we want to use at in a, within a particular context. For instance, the URL is localhost. I don't want to have to create um, always enter localhost everywhere. I can easily create an environment for a particular purpose, set certain variables in it, and reuse that variable across board. So whenever I, I want to change that variable, I just change it in the environment, and it's the change cuts across all my requests. So, okay, let's use a new environment I've created now. Let me create another one. Okay, let's assume I want to put my URL inside of this environment. So, local URL. Of course, my URL's value is HTTP localhost 8080. I save it. This guy is blocking me. I can easily set the environment I want to use, but the different environments are set here. So of course, you can, depending on the variables you've set, you can easily change your environment. You, you can, a typical example would be um, your API providers are giving you a stage, a test, a, a test URL and a production URL. So of course, the test URL, there are two separate URLs. You want to know when you are using that of the test and you want to know when you're using that of the production. You could create two different environments. One is for production, one is for test. They will both have a local URL, for instance, or they will both have a URL variable and the values would be depending on which particular one you want to speak with. And then you can alternate the environments using your environment selection here. So let's take, uh, so I change this to, so for us to call an environment variable in any place, you do two brackets like this. So you already has picked it. And if I put it on it, I can see the current values, HTTP localhost. If I have, another environment called sample2. This environment also has URL, and the URL in this case is now HTTP, maybe HTTPS, our host, maybe it's no longer 8080, it's now 8090. This can also be here, I save it. So now, on my get request, URL is what I'm looking for. Now I can just, when I want to speak to that one, I can just switch from here to sample two and the URL is different. So um, these are certain concepts within Postman. There are a whole lot of other things down to you mocking your APIs, uh, mocking servers, being able to monitor servers, a whole, a whole, whole lot, and is a usual is a major tool for testers, the major tool for developers. Both when I mean developers, now both the um, API providers and the API consumers, and yeah, I think I would want to take some questions if there are any within. Hello. Okay. I'm to go for okay. So guys, if you have questions, drop it in the chat. You can start dropping your questions. It looks like everyone already understood what's Postman can do before coming here today. Uh, maybe. Don't be shy. Ask your questions. If you understood, just say I understood. You can drop it Don't via chat. Thank you. 
if you are shy to speak. Yeah, that's true. You can also raise your hands. So is it safe to say that there are no questions and the class was understood? Okay, up to Karima understood the class, all right. Okay, we have, okay, that eight people. So all eight, please give your response. Thank you. Okay, Bendex, you can go ahead on unmute. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Yeah, thank you very much for the class. I, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm having serious network issue here. So I can barely hear you sometimes. My, the voice do skip sometimes. And some other time I do hear you clearly. So I wanted to explain more on when and how to use query parameters. And uh, you made mention of some something else. Pass variables. Uh, Variables, yeah. So okay. When are we supposed to make a logical decision to use a query parameters or part variable? Okay, all right. Um, typically there is no rule on it. However, however, there is no direct rule. We would say um, if there are a lot of parameters, it's preferable to use query parameters because they are easily separated. It becomes a bit more, it becomes confusing when there are more than one or um, when it starts, when path variable starts becoming much. Let's just give a quick sample. Let me share my screen again. Okay. Okay, so yeah, you can, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, so let's take this um, this search parameter for instance. I have a search. I have an API that allows me for me to search. This API allows me to also page in it in case there are a lot of people that is answering faith in the database. So I can easily set the page is equals to page. Then I'm looking for page one or let's say page zero, and I'm looking for the size should be maybe five, maybe 35 I want to show at a single time. There are three particular fields here. It's easy for us to know the value of each field. It's easy for the person implementing or the person consuming to know the, to say, to say what he wants to pass in each field because they are purely separated. Search is equal to this. Page is equal to this. Size is equal to this. If I were to use path variable for this case, let's assume the person that did the implementation says I should the path variable after I've after I've gotten after my path has gotten to search, the path variable, the first one should be what am I searching for? The second one should be what page am I on? The third one should be what um what's the size of the page I want. It becomes a bit confusing when I see it this way because it's more than one. It's more than one, it's up to three. It becomes confusing. I can easily interchange it and move the size to maybe the two, this second one will end up being 12, while this one will be zero. And with this, everything is messed up. The person will end up bringing page 12, which probably there's nothing there, and zero, which means there's no, and it's, I'm saying it should not even return anything. So this is a wrong request. It's easy to make mistakes when the path, when you use path variable for multiple um, parameters. But for query parameters, they are specific, they are stated key and value. So nobody can make mistakes. You can't interchange the size with the page because it clearly says page is equals to this, size is equals to this. So a rule I would say I typically use is if I'm, Searching for just if I want the if the variable I'm looking for if the um, parameter is just one, 
I can easily put it in a path variable. So the person does not have to construct a query parameter. The reason why path variable is a bit nice, query parameter um, setup in certain languages is a bit like, you have to do an extra work to compile the query parameters, but the path variable is part of the original URL. It's part of the original URL as it is now, this is the whole URL. I can just give this URL to somebody. Of course, with query parameters, you can also give it to somebody, but in certain, in some code language, you have to construct the query parameters separately and then append it to the original uh, URL. So it's a bit tedious to do. So if it's just one, why not you just pass it as a path variable? But if it's more than one, if it's getting a lot to prevent confusion, preferable to use a query parameter. I don't know if that answers your question. Hello. Um, Bendex, you can speak. Okay, he said yeah. Okay, uh, any other person with any more question? Uh, Bendex, you can drop your hand. Sorry to not pain you. So I think, so guys, you have two minutes. Please drop your questions if you have any, or at least tell your instructor. Abdul thank you for taking our time to come here and show you things tonight. All right. Uh, so I see. Okay, there are no questions here. So guys, you can follow him on LinkedIn and connect with him. I just dropped his LinkedIn handle here. I linked his LinkedIn handle. So thank you so much, Abdukafa, for a wonderful session. It was clear and precise. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a nice night. All right, so thank you so much. Good night. All right, good night. All right.